guys, how's it going? Today we're gonna to be looking at some narrow or skinny side yards. Now, these are your photo submissions, except for the first one. I'm going to be walking you through the transformation of our last garden, uh, not really in its entirety, but we'll show you what it looked like when we moved into our townhouse, which was one sixth of an acre, and what it looked like when we moved out. I wasn't quite done with that space, but it was a fun one to learn in. We received a lot of submissions. Thank you so much to all of you who sent them. There's a lot of inspiration to be had and such a perfect thing to do this time of year. Um, like I said in the container video, when we still have snow on the ground and we're in planning mode and it's just fun to see different styles and how you guys have just, like your creativity is amazing and I, I draw so much inspiration from that. So narrow side yards are a difficult thing to deal with because a lot of times we're dealing with, well, space restrictions, one, most of the time we still want a, a way to get down that the uh, side yard while not taking up too much space for the walkway because we want beautiful things too. We want beautiful plantings. Oftentimes we're also dealing with light issues because it's usually right up next to a house or a building. Um, so depending on how that's positioned, you might have a full shade area or a full sun area. Um, our house, so this first picture will just cruise right into our um, yard here. Our house was positioned to where that wall there by the AC unit is the south side. So it was a hot area, full sun, all day long. You can see there, if you look even further to the left, there was not a fence between our grass and our neighbor's grass, which the neighbors were Aaron's parents li live next to our in-laws. So we did put in a fence there, which gave us about, oh, I want to say eight to 10 feet in the end. It was very narrow. And then when you're dealing with an AC unit, you kind of just add that on top. This is right when we moved in, you guys. So you see the linden tree there planted. There was one other tree in the front. Those were dug up and moved and it was kind of a blank slate for us. So you can see right here what we did. You see the brand new fence. It's still nice and shiny in that picture, but you can see how narrow it was. The rough cut uh, grass pathway there. We decided to go with the grass pathway because that's what was there and we were utilizing it. And I kind of wanted to try it. And you know we're going to be experimenting with that out in the, well, we've already put in grass pathways in the South Garden, but through the cut flower garden as well this next year. Um, but you can see how narrow the planting beds were. I mean, I want to say in some areas, areas they were a foot and a half. Um, and they kind of sloped up there on the left. So we did get some water runoff, not much, but a little bit from uh, my in-law's grass. So those are all just things you have to take into consideration. The next picture, you can see the garden is a little bit more developed, but it changed a lot even uh, from this picture. This is also proof that I do occasionally put my hair in a ponytail. Uh, but right there by the AC unit, I had some silver leaf pears and I had put three in. They were getting beautiful and huge and starting to go up over the walkway. The whole feeling I wanted in this area was it to be kind of cozy and secret garden-ish. One winter we had a really harsh cold snap and it killed all three of my um, pears. So I had to take those all out. But I think the very best thing that I did in this space that I learned in this space was to select some smaller evergreens that would provide some winter structure and some bone structure for the area. So you can see the, the uh, Green Mountain Cone Boxwoods there. I did 10 of those, so five groups of two. They flanked each other along the walkway. You know, uh, it, the walkway kind of curved. Looking back, I would not have done a curved walkway. It's too narrow of an area to be doing that. I would have probably done straight. Um, but, I mean, it worked out okay. The boxwoods were amazing. I loved that. Now you can see further on down the road, I had put in along the wall there an apple tree. I was utilizing that long southern exposure of blank wall to grow some produce. And we had started to pull up the grass and I was experimenting with pavers to see if I wanted to do pavers there. Um, I had found with the grass pathways, if they were not mowed almost like every other day, they just looked overgrown and gave the whole area a kind of untidy look to me and I did not prefer that. So the next picture here, you can see where we had opted to go with flagstone which I thought was a beautiful look and provided that the weight that that area needed. Um, we'd also come along with some more fluffy things. You know, there's a um, Diana Larch there on the left and a peony and some impatience and uh, it was very much so in process, but also putting in pieces like the lamppost was helpful, I thought. There's a couple of like dusk pictures. I think this is right when Aaron had bought a brand new camera and these were the first pictures he took, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he, yeah, because I think he, we got home from work and he got this new camera. He unboxed it and went right outside and took some pictures. Uh, and so it really shows like the beautiful layering. You can see the um, tricolor beach in there. And I selected things that I knew would 
I mean, tricolor beaches in the right circumstances will get enormous. Uh, but in our area, I mean, they grow like this much a year and you can keep them pruned. And so I just chose things that um, I knew would stay semi-contained in our area. Uh, but I did want that overflowing, abundant look. And you can see Lamium on the ground there kind of spilling into the unfinished pathway and um, Iris is there. Oh, brings back memories. And, oh, Russell, <laughs> can you lay down over here? Come on. There we go. So there's the uh, apple tree a little bit more mature. Um, I don't know that we had a picture without me standing there, but I guess it shows the scale. I was on a step ladder there and was able to harvest quite a lot of produce, um, even though they had only been there for a couple of years and a couple uh, pretty pictures, close ups of what the finished end of the pathway looked like with hostas and impatiens. You know, eventually, you know, you saw the, the space in the beginning. So you started with this full sun space and then all of a sudden you put some things in a couple of years later, you can start shifting over to shade. So that was our uh, side yard. Again, I had not finished the rocks. There were some plants I'd probably pull out. I think they're still there, but it's fun uh, when we go to his parents' house, I can see over the fence and I had planted some things like viburnum starts out on my parents' garden that were this big, four or five inches tall, and now they're 10, 12 feet tall. Uh, it's amazing to see the growth. Okay, now we're gonna move into your submissions. Let me get my list up here. First one is from Katie Gray in Seattle, Washington, zone 8B, and this is a beautiful space. She did include some information. It's 30 feet long by 15 feet wide, acidic soil, full shade, beautiful mix of colors and textures though. I mean, take a look at the left side right there, kind of right below the deck. There's the beautiful uh, vertical accent is that I think might be a cypress of some kind, but my eye, when I initially look at this picture, goes right to that huge blue hosta. But the brilliant thing is that blue pot in the background because of the blue color of the hosta, it brings out the blue color of that pot and it draws your eye down. I think that's really awesome. And then the layering with the Japanese maple up above the hosta and the more brown or red colored carex with the more fine texture. It's just a beautiful space. Right hand side, it looks like a plum tree. Um, there's maybe a fir behind that and then a row of hydrangeas. Excellent job, Katie. Next one is Kimberly in Rochester, which is New York, right? Zone five. This is a fun before and after. So take a look at the before shot here. Um, it, she said it had been long neglected, approximately 50 feet long by 10 feet wide, full of Japanese knotweed, gets a couple hours of morning sun, the rest of the day in shade. Uh, so she said she already had some containers, look at this midway shot, the containers she had, and then she took approximately $1,000 to buy landscape fabric, soil amendments, uh, gravel, some other in-ground plantings, which to the side there you can see there's a buddleia and a viburnum, um, there's a panicle hydrangea there by the, the staircase. Uh, she also bought some paint, you can see in this final shot, look at that, isn't that amazing? So she painted the stair railings, that alone brightened up that space hugely, um, adding the rocks along the walkway, I think provided some amazing um, definition. Really, really like that. And then the addition of mulch and all of that. Um, gardening in containers in an area like that is really, uh, especially when you're dealing with an invasive weed you're trying to get rid of, is a really smart way of doing it. And then you can swap plants out too, a lot, uh, maybe not a lot easier, um, but you can just experiment with some, with some things, see what really thrives in your containers. And eventually once you've handled all the weeds down below, you can start planting in ground if that's something you wanna do. But I do think that those tall containers add a lot of vertical interest underneath the canopy that you can see there without having something to stay within the size parameter, you know, something planted in the ground. But in the right there, you can see the color, the beautiful impatience and the blooms on the, the uh, hydrangea and I see the angel statue in the background. That's really neat, Kimberly. Next one is Putra in New Jersey and I do apologize if I'm saying your name wrong, but I did take one glance at this photo and I knew it was yours. She's on Instagram as Good Path Garden and provides a lot of inspirational pictures and beautiful uh, ideas from her own garden. She said that the cedar arbor with the dark stain was inspired by ours that we have here and she likes how it draws your eye down and it certainly does. I love the emerald green arborvita hedge there. That's a beautiful evergreen interest. And then the hydrangeas here, you, she did say were lime rickies and invincible limettas. So just that bright, I love that bright clean color palette with the white and the different different kind of shades of green there. I also love the use of the square stepping stones. It gives it a little bit more of a modern feel, but it brings that um, weight to the garden, that kind of tidiness that I felt like I was missing in our first garden. And that's the reason why I tore up my grass. Had I seen your idea, I probably would have adopted something similar. I think it's just absolutely beautiful. I do see a little lavender peeking through on the left-hand side. 
bottom corner. Couple other things, she is in a zone 7A. This gets morning shade and full afternoon sun. Next one is from Irene, who's in Sterling, which is in the US, zone 6B. Now this is a beautiful space because if you look at the mix of plants here, uh, she did note that it's dappled light and it's taken her years of experimenting to figure out a mix of sun and shade perennials that could go in this area based on where the light fell um, to make it look the way it does right now. She said, I've got it down pat at this point and I, that's clear to me <laughs> because boy, these plants look healthy. They're thriving and beautiful. I love the layering here. So right in front, the big beautiful hosta. You see tucked in kind of behind the little statue, there's a Brunnera, right next to it there's Phlox, which likes full sun, and Brunnera, which wants shade. And then beyond that you can see, I think that might be a red hookera tucked in there, and some Echinacea, purple fountain grass. Absolutely beautiful mix. Um, it's been a little bit of a process though. She said that this narrow garden was a pile of red clay with hu three huge boulders, two of which blocked the entrance from the front of the house. So they removed those and left one, which is pictured right behind the hosta there, which I think is really neat to leave a little piece of what was there to begin with. Uh, we don't have a lot of that here. Like in our garden, it was just all flat. You know, I mean, you saw what the South Garden looked like in the beginning. It was just all kind of brush and there's no stones, no contour. So it's really neat to see, uh, you know, people utilizing some of what was there when they started. But I love the flagstone pathway there and the way that it has a very gentle curve. I think that's where I got mine wrong. In our last place, I tried to put too many curves in it. I think that's just perfect and it ushers you from one end to the other beautifully. Love that, Irene. Next is from Cherry in Bonnie Lake, which is in the United States, zone 8B. Now this space goes through an incredible transformation. Check out the before here. She said it's five feet wide total. Uh, that's really narrow. That would be incredibly hard to think of what to do, but look at this. Look at that afterward. I cannot believe that's only five feet. Having it set up this way gives it the illusion that it's uh, wider than that. I mean, that's a perfect walkway to put in there, something that takes you from you know one end to the other, it just draws your eye down. And then what beautiful color too, just fitting in so many beautiful things. So it's a mix of Creeping Jenny, there's Blue Eyed Grass, I do see some Birch Hybrid Campanula bottom left there, I think. Uh, there's some Impatience, Sun Patience, Azalea, uh, a large hosta in the terracotta pot in the background, but what a fun way to use that space. Now, Cherry said that cramscaping is her thing. <laughs> so that's my people. I like to cramscape myself. Next is Robin in Santa Clarita zone nine. Now this is showing use of vertical space rather than planting in the ground because there was already a, a concrete sidewalk that was four feet wide, which four feet, you know, is I think, is that standard walkway? Um, but you know, if you're wanting to get anything from your front yard to your backyard, it is nice to kind of keep that open. So using wall space like this and putting planters on it uh, is a really great way, great way to soften up an area like this. So they used rain gutters, which were inexpensive, popped holes in them, put cactus mix in, planted cuttings of succulents, and I, I don't know if there are cactus in there. Let me take a closer look. There may be, but I love the color palette being kind of soft, like the, the aeoniums. I think that's a kiwi aeonium there. That's the big rosette. You can see that kind of apricot peach and yellow in the leaf, which kind of mirrors the wall color, like it complements it really well, as well as the euphorbia fire sticks right behind it, has that peachy color. Uh, because it's north facing, I don't know if I already said that, uh, it's not gonna get as much light to make the succulents be super brightly colored, but I think they look beautiful with the wall color that's there. Really great job. Next is from Lystra in Ontario, Canada, Zone 5. This is a really incredible idea. They had a three-foot space uh, from their driveway, which you can see on the left, to their property line that met up with their neighbors. There was a chain link fence there, which they removed, and then placed a, a, a three-foot tall planting bed that just met up to where that fence was. And let's see, that one is three foot tall, one and a half feet deep, and it runs 44 feet long. And then the one right below it is a two foot deep planting space that runs the same length. Isn't that a neat idea for a fence? Only needing three feet for that area. So there's uh, wood and then some metal there uh, to create your raised bed look. And then in it, there are munchkin sunflowers. So ones that don't get super huge, summerific hibiscus, butterfly bushes, super tunia bubblegum, roses, marigolds, red hot poker, and daylilies. How cool is that? Uh, morning sun watered on drip and fertilized every two weeks and soil was very rocky and they had uh, to amend it with compost and topsoil from a local landscape company because I'm guessing that that um, 
two foot planting space they kind of built up you can see that board that runs in front to give it like a raised bed look but i'm guessing it goes straight down into the native soil there uh, but that is just such an incredible idea and very colorful love the mix of plants that's very fun i bet you that that actually makes people slow down when they drive by i would Try to check out what's in there. Next is Shannon from Marysville, Washington, zone 8B with a side yard that's six feet wide. And I love hearing the, the transformation process. They said this was all grass to begin with and it got really marshy every single winter and would rot. So they removed the grass, brought in compost every year to improve the soil and now look at it. I love the big boulders lining the flower bed, giving it some distinction from the walkway there and a beautiful mix of plants there. There's azaleas, lungwort, you can see the variegated bishop's weed which oh when I see the bishop's weed I think oh my goodness that's going to take over your life but the conditions here are shady with dappled light for part of the day but no like direct sun so I think that that bishop's weeds bishop weed will kind of stay in check there um, there's also white bleeding heart and a juga so you can see the first air, uh, view there and then from the other side looking the other direction you can see the view and I like the addition of the trellises on the wall even if you don't have anything growing on them I think they provide a really beautiful uh, thing to look at. It's kind of like having a statue there. Next is Paula in Moorhead, which is in the U.S., zone 3-4. So this is a bed using all annuals, which I thought was really neat, and it's only two feet deep. Two-foot flower beds are incredibly tough, so utilizing annuals like this is a really, it's a great use of that space to provide a ton of color. Uh, 22 feet long is what it is, and it's a mixture of coleus, purple fountain grass, dusty miller, diamond frost euphorbia, or diamond mountain euphorbia rather, you can see that on the left there. Uh, but the varieties of coleus are redhead, electric lime, black dragon. Those are really pretty together. I just saw that and it's just so striking. Four hours of sun is what it receives, never is fertilized after planting, uh, and it's very heavy alkaline soil, which I can uh, I commiserate with you on that, I guess. <laughs> alkaline soil can be tough. Uh, so in areas like that where you're dealing with a super cold zone, really tough high pH soil, it's uh, a lot of times it's a lot easier to use annuals in areas like that because an annual won't show high pH deficiencies really because they're not in the ground long enough i guess to really suffer from from it anyway really great use of that space next one i thought was really interesting because you don't necessarily have to put in a garden in a space put something in that you will enjoy that will actually make you go to that part of the yard so here there is a putting green so you can tell that this is a home of a person who loves to golf so this is from joanne in san diego california zone 10a she said this is a, a really tough spot, spot for them to garden because it was very little sun, watering was very difficult to control, and water is a pretty rare commodity down in California. So this was a really good solution just to take that stuff out and make this a space that they could actually use that wasn't a problem. So anyway, I thought that that was worth sharing because um, it does show us a way to kind of think outside the box. Next is from Russ in Toronto, Canada, zone 6B. This is an amazing before and after. So take a look at the before, just kind of a you know, typical driveway. There's a garage in the background. There's a little cluster of pots and some plants along the way, but take a look at this transformation. So the addition of what looks like a porch there on the right, they say that they actually don't use the garage as a garage. It's more of a garden shed at this point, uh, but the plants here, oh my goodness. And the columns, like that's so striking to me with the brickwork down below, there's the huge, fern hanging from the porch there and then just a bunch of healthy looking plants. So let me list off what he said is in this area. He said this is at the end of our fence driveway which gradually got taken over by plants, it tends to happen. We don't use the garage anymore for parking uh, so it's a more of a garden shed, 35 feet long and only about 10 feet wide which is amazing. This whole area looks much wider than that. Um, the plants are goldenrod, goldenrod along the fence, sweet autumn clematis, rose of Sharon, joe pie weed, Japanese angelica tree, uh, potted banana, climbing hydrangea, potted hostas, begonias, and house plants. This area receives three to four hours of sunlight is all. I love the arch too. Oh, and the pavers. I say the pavers were there, were not there. So it looks like the back part, right? The back part of the driveway was maybe taken up and then the pavers were added. I always appreciate people with a design eye like that who can really put together a space that's beautiful like that. Dang. 
Next is Vicki in Florida zone nine, where she said it rarely dips, but like into the high 20s. So it's kind of a hot and humid area, but beautiful color. So the planting beds are four feet wide and then the walkway is about four feet. The sun patients next to the boxwoods, beautiful. And then you can see that really beautiful fluffy fern toward the back end. And then the bright white sun patients with the bright white caladiums there on the left. Uh, when they moved into this area, there was three huge hollies that were existing already, some azaleas and old hydrangea, um, and then this jasmine, which was trimmed down to a stump. So they put a new trellis up for it, and that looks absolutely beautiful. Um, but the soil sandy, but has been amended and stays on the acidic side, which the shrubs appreciate. There are shrubs that I can't grow here, which is, well, due to zone and soil type. So it's really fun to see them like this in somebody's garden. <laughs> It's funny, oftentimes when I look at you know people's gardens who are in really warm zones, I often can't even identify the plants because I'm so unfamiliar um, with the plants that will grow in those sorts of zones. Next is from Almeda or Almeda in California zone 9B. Uh, this is a fun looking space, just a lot of beautiful color, a lot of different things, a lot of potted items. I'm guessing that this is AstroTurf, so a different idea for a pathway there. And I, I only say that because these pots with pot feet and on pot stands are sitting right on it. Um, so I'm guessing that, you know, you're not having to cut it uh, because you probably wouldn't plant huge crab apple trees in a pot right on top of your grass unless, you know, it was something, a low maintenance option. Uh, but she said that they are crab apple trees in big pots and too many other plants to name. Lots of petunias in there. There's beautiful delphinium popping up there on the right hand side. Um, and a whole bunch of other things. I can see some euphorbia there on the left, some salvias with some like magenta blooms, a sunflower, a big canna in the back there and some evergreen interest. Oh, it would be fun to see this one like through the seasons and see what different areas look like because I'm guessing, well in a 9B, I don't know how much of this goes away in a 9B, but it's a really fun space. Watered with drip, irrigation, fertilized every week with a liquid fertilizer. Next one is from Liam in Toronto, Canada, zone 6B. And he said, this is a simple east facing shade side garden. It gets one hour of morning sun. So a really great looking flower bed for those of you who need some shade garden ideas. There is a list of plants included. So there's Pachysandra, which is the bright green right up front. I noticed that Jack uh, Barnwell on Mackinac Island, he uses a lot of Pachysandra as a ground cover there. And I've always admired that. I need to add some into our garden, but that is a beautiful look especially up against that climbing hydrangea. I think it sets it off beautifully. There's hostas, there's a ligularia uh, right there at the corner of the house. Uh, let's see, did I miss anything? And there's an astilbe in there. I think that's beautiful and I love the flagstones in the grass. Beautiful flower bed idea. Next is Sandra in Germany, zone 7B, and her planting beds, she says, are one meter deep, which is just over three feet. Beautiful blend of plants here. You can see right along the side of the house there, there's an evergreen and then lavender and salvia. Uh, there's no plant list included, so I'm just gonna try to do my best here, but beautiful along the fence there. So there's the grass walkway lined with uh, pavers or bricks. I think that's a really great way of edging your grass and something I would love to do out in our cut flower garden if we didn't have to drive a tractor into the quadrants to till or do any kind of work uh, that way. Oh, I just really like the definition that that gives to flower borders, but you can see the black lace elderberry there, maybe a mock orange I'm guessing up against the fence. There's lavender. Uh, we take a closer look. Um, there's some uh, hardy geranium in there, drumstick alliums, geraniums, daisies, just beautiful stuff. Gara, there's some gara in there. This just gives us a lot of good plant combination ideas, Sandra. Lovely, love it. And the last one we're gonna look at today is from Janie in Northern California, which is a zone 9B. She actually has a YouTube channel called Dig Plant Water Repeat, so we should check that out. But I love what she did along her fence line here uh, because she said it's kind of a dinky side yard and that's where they keep their garbage cans, but she wanted something beautiful to look out at because that's her view from her kitchen window. Um, so she espaliered some honeysuckle in a really beautiful pattern. Uh, she said, west facing with some afternoon sun, it does take some maintenance to keep it pruned that way, but it's so worth it. And then colorful annuals in a window box that kind of peek up you know, from the window. So she's standing there doing dishes. You can see some beautiful color. When she took this video, it was right now. Um, so there's cyclamen, it's warm enough there to where they can still have those outside. We, we can't here, uh, but in the summertime, they have other colorful annuals there. So beautiful color there. And then something really architecturally 
interesting. So low maintenance, of course, on the ground, there's uh, rocks and things down there, and then just a beautiful pattern. I would love to do that somewhere here. So I think that's a really, a really great idea. And that's it, you guys, for today's video of narrow or skinny side yard inspiration. Thank you to all of you who took the time to send us pictures and information. Like I said, this is probably gonna be a part one, just like with containers. We'll put together another one uh, just because there's, there's so many beautiful ideas out there and it just, like, it gets my creative juices flowing and makes me start thinking about fun projects to do outside. And I hope it does the same for you guys as well. I hope you're having a great day and we will see you in the next video. Bye.